All right, everybody, welcome back to the U.S. Regional Championship coverage. My name is Corey Ballmeister, and I am joined by previously Platinum Pro, Brian Brondu. And BBD, are you excited for this round? We got a doozy on our hand. Oh, I am excited to see uh, some different decks, I guess we could say. Not, not unusual, but different than what we've seen. Yes, and one of them especially I very, very much am looking forward to seeing. So going into round 11, though, let's check out our standings of our players who, you know, really have their top eight sites, um, you know, in uh, uh, at the end of the tunnel here. So starting it off, we have Mac Endress here. We just saw win um, this last match to be the only 10-0 player at the top. And BBD, we can finally see, you know, where the top 16 here is not just X one players. So that leads me to believe that, you know, it's kind of narrowing down any other big surprises from these standings. I, I think it's uh there's two different four color decks, like control type decks that are both nine and one. So I think that's an interesting uh, thing that I wasn't really expecting coming into the tournament to see two decks like that in the, you know, top 10 decks in this event. Yeah, and there we go. We also see at 8 0 oh, 2, we have Jody Keith on Mono White Martyr here. That makes a lot of sense that that deck would pick up some draws, I must say, but still undefeated on the weekend. Jody's deck looks pretty awesome. We also have Matt Nass here, um, you know, our combo pro here playing Gogara Yagmoth at 9 and 1, looking great to return to the Pro Tour or even top 8 this event. So. Really exciting stuff here. So let's get into our coverage here of round of ele round 11 and start with our deck list here. So we have Faye Brown here playing Domain Zoo. This is a Scion of Draco and a Leyline of the Guild Pack deck, but I'm also seeing previously banned card Wild Nakatl. Tell me about this list, BBD. <laughs> yeah, I, I played <laughs> in the Pro Tour where Wild Nakatl was unbanned and it was all over that tournament. Um, was it good? I think it was decent. I don't okay. think it was. Yeah, it's. I don't know. I'd have to go back. But this, okay. yeah, this domain zoo deck is just a really aggressive deck that's based around you know the concept of d domain. So Leyland of the Guild Pact will give you uh, all five land types, and it's actually really easy to get those land types even without the ley line, uh, thanks to these triomes, and that lets you play these domain oriented cards like Sign of Draco, Neshoba, Brawler, Territorial Kabu, and so forth to have these giant over-costed creatures at cheap mana costs. Yeah, and I just can't wait to see a Regavan with Vigilant, Hexproof, Lifelink, and First Strike and Trample coming at me. That seems uh, pretty disgusting, I must say. It is, yeah. It, it probably needs like one more keyword ability to be good there, but... Yeah, dash. So d don't forget about yeah, the dash. There we go. That's, that's still coming out. So, all right, Faye needs an opponent here. So let's take a look at another one of my favorite decks here in the format. This is Ethan King, a very well-respected Magic player here, playing four-color creativity. But am I seeing this correctly? There's no blue cards here, BBD? This is more of like a Mardu creativity. I'm here for it. Yeah, this is a little bit different of a creativity list that's more based around Archon at all costs. So instead of being, you know, more of a controlling element deck, like the like the normal versions of Creativity, where you're trying to set up this turn to Creativity to get an Archon into play, this deck can still do that. But what it can also do is uh, put an Archon into the graveyard and then persist it. So there's there's multiple elements here of of ways to get an Archon into play. This is a little bit more of an aggressively combo uh, version of it. So what would you say are some of the key cards in this five color creativity deck? Um, I would say it's, uh, if I had to pick two, it would be Archon of Cruelty and Archon of Cruelty. What if you just had to pick a third for posterity's sake? Archon of Cruelty. All right, you passed the meme test, absolutely. So we got Ethan King here down in the feature match. Looks like our players are ready to go. I wanna see this matchup in action as this looks Really, really awesome. So we got Faye Brown up against Ethan King. And we'll see. Looks like a mulligan to six there from Ethan. Yeah, I think this is a, I mean, you know, you, you know, you, you'll have to mulligan hands in any matchup if you just draw garbage. But 
yeah. this is the kind of matchup where you need to have a good hand because of the speed that the domain zoo can offer. Yep, totally agree. So here we go. Ethan firing it off with the bloodstained mire. Faye going with sacred foundry here and passing it back. But yeah, in the bottom part of our screen there, there is that ley line. That's exactly what I wanted to see from them. Yeah, I mean that's gonna that's gonna enable the best draws of this domain zoo deck. One thing one thing I'm interested to to see is you know the impact of a card like Stubborn Denial in this matchup. Yeah, I mean that's a card we have not seen in a long time, but it seems like it's going to be excellent in this matchup. Yeah, I think I think a lot of this matchup is going to come down to key moments around big cards like that. So do you think this style of deck is well positioned? We'll start with uh, the Domain Zoo deck. Um, you know, like, is this kind of game plan viable or is it really only turned on with the printing of Leyline of the Guild Pack? I think it was a viable deck before. Uh, I, th I think it's, it, it is a viable strategy. Um, and one thing about Modern is that there really are a ton of viable strategies even though, you know, kind of the top decks are, there's like, you know, maybe two or three decks that are really the top decks, you can do well with, with so many more decks than just that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So here we go. Leyline of the Guild Pack plus Cyan of Draco. BBD, for some people who haven't seen this interaction, walk us through a little bit of what is happening now. So Leyline of the Guild Pack gives all your lands all land types. So Sign of Draco will cost just two mana with a ley line in play. It also gives Sign of Draco, it gives your permanence all colors as well, which turns on the bottom line of Sign of Draco where it provides five different keyworded abilities to all your creatures. Yeah, and I mean, that seems like it's of course extremely powerful in a matchup where your opponent is trying to like unholy heat this or something like that. But, you know, this matchup where Ethan is trying to just go way over the top uh, with creativity, it might not be as, you know, busted here, but it still seems quite good. Yeah, it, it's not, it, it doesn't make it bad. It's just not maybe the optimal situation, but it's still very powerful. Oh, yeah, and a second sign of Draco BBD, that is one heavy play. <laughs> that is indeed a heavy play, straight out of the deck box, <laughs> right onto the play mat. Yeah, absolutely, and if you want to check out what heavy play has to offer, make sure to use that promo code in your bottom right-hand corner, 10% uh, off with code DENVER24. I just set you up for that one, BBD, just set you up for the perfect plug. That was a nice setup. I, I spiked it, sadly, right into the net. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was a heavy play on your part as well. That was a heavy punt, yeah. <laughs> a heavy punt. All right, so here we go. Shaman getting in there and looking at Ethan's hand, that quick glance, I saw persist. I saw uh, dig through time at home. Um, we have the Shadow Prophecy there, which is kind of the best impression of the card, but I didn't see creativity but with how fast uh, Ethan's going, it looks like Mike. Looks like and there might be some verbal communication here, huh? Yeah, there's definitely some verbal communication here, and there is that stubborn denial, huge, wow. huge blowout play here. Yeah, that was huge here. As one archon was looking very prime to uh, you know take over here, and we see that one treasure as well. So. Wow, and there we go. Just two scions attacking and a bolt to finish that off. That was uh, quite impressive there from Faye. Yeah, Th like that was just an incredibly powerful start with that one piece of interaction to hit the important turn and then the game was just already over. That's kind of the power that that domain sign of Draco start can provide. So the one thing there is I didn't see any removal from Ethan that could have actually killed a sign of Draco, even if it wasn't hexproof there. So do you think that those ley lines, as sweet as they are at creating these rainbow scion of Dracos, do you think they're going to stay in for the post-board games? Or You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think it depends on, you know, what how how important it is for the deck to function, which I, I don't know if it's that important. You can get there with your lands. And then also, 
you know, what, what the intention is for this particular matchup. So I, I could see them getting boarded out, but it's, it's, it's hard to say for sure. Totally agree. Okay. So it sounds like our players are ready to go for game number two. And first of all, I want to give a shout out to the whole production crew as well as the casters and everything. Uh, you know, you notice that you don't really see them shuffling and sideboarding. Well, that's on purpose. We get to fast forward through that stuff so we can just bring you nothing but magic BBD. Isn't that just the dream? It is a dream for sure. <laughs> oh, you'd rather watch some shuffling and uh, um, tanking on mulligan decisions? I think we can make that happen. I want to watch a tournament coverage that's only that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the that's the bonus features here where we cut out all the gameplay, only shuffling. We've probably got that. That's like the that's like the archive. that's like the extended edition right there. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be like watching coverage of your matches here with, you know, how slow you usually were when you were playing. But. <laughs> All right, we got a turn one Regavan here for Faye heading over to Ethan's here for turn number two to see if there is the exact play that you do not want to see when you have a turn one Regavan, but sometimes you have no choice. We'll see if Ren and Six is there. If my Regavan just gets lightning bolted when they could have went Ren and Six, I count that as a win. I count that as a win as well. And here we go. We have the two mana. It's not Sign of Draco this time, but Territorial Kabu hits the battlefield. Another really powerful card here from one of the Modern Horizon sets. Yeah. I think Territorial Kabu in particular is, is incredibly good in this matchup. It can exile Archon of Cruelty from the graveyard, as well as just being a normal like way to kind of filter your draws. And just and just being a, a big threat that ends the game quickly. Yeah, two mana five five with extra text. You know, I mean, Watch Wolf has come a, a long way. You know, absolutely. It's still no Tarmogoyf, but it's it's almost there. I mean, what is you know only Matt Nass found that tech uh, as well as Sam Party to be sideboarding such a powerful two drop. But my favorite thing to do to Territorial Kavu. Uh, most of the times, this card's in my deck because it's probably my favorite card of all time. Is Cast a little dress down while that card's in play. Ends up working out quite nicely. Yeah, it certainly addresses the issue of that card. Yeah, it does. All right, so here is land number three. Their sign of Draco, which is going to give some boosts here. Uh, doing a land check here, we have green, white, blue, red, and black. So domain is fully there. Uh, Archon of Cruelty getting out of the graveyard. And normally that kind of play, the exile a card in the graveyard, with territorial kavu normally does nothing in this five color creativity match but with ethan's version uh where you are persisting back the archon it could have just been game breaking there if that card was in Ethan's deck. yeah like that that could have been kind of one of the game defining plays where where ethan was forced to to discard that uh to pro likely to, to hit a land drop but oh. that puts him in a spot where now he hit like if his plan was to persist it that's no longer available. And I mean, you get to do something extra juicy if you get to persist Archon of Cruelty, then you can sack Bitter Triumph to use that extra text on the card to give it haste. So not only will you get the come into play trigger, but you'll get the attack trigger as well. And it, I mean, that's just game. Yeah, it's if it's not game, it's it's very close. Very true, but we do see from Faye that Steam Vents is open, so they have the ability to either Lightning Bolt or cast a Stubborn Denial, and you got to think, BBD, if there is a Stubborn Denial there, it's going to be a tough game for Ethan to win. Yeah, they're in a great spot here. Being able to, again, like, so much pressure on Ethan here, almost, almost a lethal attack in play, and it was so easy to assemble that board, and there is the Stubborn Denial. Denial on the leyline binding, and you see just the head shake there from Ethan. It's like, wow, what do I do here? You know, I mean, both these players have a great record, but uh, you know, this is kind of two off meta decks that are uh bumping heads against each other. Probably nothing that they're super prepared for, but you, I, I would really think that Faye Brown has the advantage in this deck for sure in this matchup. Yeah, it does look that way. Both. You know, it's not really two ships passing the night, but in a way, it's like two very volatile, powerful decks going up against each other. Yeah. And I think Faye just has an, a little bit easier of a path to 
assembling what will win the game than Ethan does. It's kind of the burden's kind of on Ethan to to be fast enough. Oh, Renan six here cannot be good. Here we go. And there is the bolt to just presumably go at the creature. Not really sure. Maybe it is just the face, but yeah, it looks to be just GG here. Faye Brown taking this down in two straight games to advance them to nine and two. Still in top eight contention, I would assume, right, BBD? Yeah, generally speaking, two losses is, is still going to be in top eight contention for these kinds of tournaments. Do you think a third loss, no matter what, eliminates you? Or is that kind of the line where it's like X21 is maybe a lock, X3, you're like hoping for tiebreakers? How, do, how does this kind of work on a normal uh, tournament? Because this is kind of like a Grand Prix, right? So we can kind of look at that kind of math. I think in general, X3 in an event of this size is probably not going to be good enough, especially because we did see there were so many draws already in this tournament. So there's mm. going to be a lot of players near the top that are probably going to be like X2 and 1, you know, maybe even with two draws and, and so forth. And that's going to kind of um, fill a lot of these in-between slots that might have a chance of getting into the top eight. Yeah, very true. But, you know, X3 is almost assuredly a lock for those Pro Tour invites as well as, you know, requalification to the RC in Dallas as well. So every match matters for these players and you just really want to avoid the train wreck of three rounds left. Please just don't lose the last three and not get anything here. So uh, that is going to do it here from our main feature. We are going to take ourselves a short little break and then we'll be back up or we'll be back with some backup features here in round number 11. So don't go anywhere. This is the ETB playmat. Conventional playmats are just giant mouse pads. You have to roll them up, they're hard to store. If you have a tube, often it doesn't fit in your backpack. The ETB playmat changes that. They're rigid internal panels, so it's easy to fold flat. They're secure magnets that keep everything shut, and it also fits in a 15 inch laptop sleeve. All right, everybody, welcome back to coverage here of the U.S. Regional Championship presented by Laughing Dragon. My name is Corey Ballmeister, and I am here joined by our 2016 World Champion playing Bant Company. You got to love that deck, huh, BBD? BBD, how you doing going into this round? You know, I'm doing great, Corey. I'm ready for even more high-level Magic the Gathering. The Gathering. Okay, so we're just going to get right into it. Let's check out our players' deck list here. We have another really spicy matchup here. Uh, you know, not really seeing all the rhinos here at the top of the deck. So here we go. We see Amulet here, BBD. And uh, yeah, I'm just seeing only green and black cards here. Maybe no other uh, spicer. So we'll just say Mono Green Amulet. Tell us a little bit about this deck. Yeah, so this is a ramp combo deck that's based around using Amulet of Vigor to allow you to immediately untap lands that would normally come into play tapped, such as the Ravnica Bounce Lands that produce two mana. And along with uh, cards like Arboreal Grazer to put extra lands into play, or Dryad of the Elysian Grove to allow you to play additional lands, this can generate obscene amounts of mana very fast, and it... Uh, culminates in, in, generally speaking, a primeval titan, which can get a variety of uh, lands to perform different effects that often win the game the turn you play it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you were saying this is one of the decks that maybe you would have played uh, if you were uh, going to be qualified for this regional championship. Usually you play other one mana artifacts like Aether Vial or something, but Amulet would have been something you would have been interested in? Yeah, it would have depended on how much time I would have had to prepare because Amulet is a very difficult deck to play. And I think one of the things that generally holds it back from being uh, a more prevalent and dominant force at the top of standings is that it's, it's, it is a difficult deck to play. It has kind of a high barrier of entry, and it's not always a deck that people enjoy playing this style. Uh, but when you do have that mastery of the deck, it is one of the best decks in the format. And it is so fun to play, and your wins feel so good when you big brain your way across the finish line. So let's take a look at Andy Wilson's opponent here. And we have Griffin Hall playing Hardened Scales, another green-black deck, we will say here, BBD. Another creature combo deck, but I think this is the first time we've seen Hardened Scales on coverage. Tell us a little bit about this spicy deck. Yeah, so this deck uses the card Hardened Scales, which pr like produces additional counters on uh, creatures when they would gain counters. And then it plays a ton of different creatures and other uh, artifacts that can put counters on creatures. And oftentimes the way that this deck can uh, close out a game is using the card Arcbound Ravager, where uh, you'll have a lot of counters on creatures. You sacrifice them to the Ravager, sometimes with Modular. The Ravager will grow really large and then can shift those counters over to a different creature. And notably, every time these kinds of interactions happen, you get one extra counter because of Hardened Scales. And it... It is a lot of math, but it scales very quickly and can produce a lot of damage and a lot of difficult situations for your opponent to navigate. Because presumably, if you're playing hard and scales, you're used to the math of the deck. Your opponent might not be. And it's not something that's intuitively obvious to calculate how much damage this deck can produce. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and don't let... Uh... Me think that that scale this deck scales uh you know went past me here i i like that pun i see what you did there bbd mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right so i'm kind of a in agreement here with twitch chat which you know i feel is already dangerous to say to agree with twitch chat but i think this is a extremely bad matchup here for griffin hall wouldn't you think amulet just really has the tools to go way over the top of this deck generally yes i agree i think that amulet is generally pretty good in these kinds of matchups where your opponent is a little bit slower than you and doesn't have a whole lot of interaction. That's that's where Amulet kind of really thrives. And even if you look at Griffin's sideboard, there are cards that are good against Amulet, like Force of Vigor, for example. But these cards are not KOs against the Amulet deck. They're slowing the. There are cards that will slow the Amulet deck down. So Griffin is really going to need to have some strong proactive draws and, and maybe find one or two pieces of sideboard interaction at the right time to pull this off, I think. Totally agree with you, but it sounds like our players are ready. So let's see if this is as bad of a matchup for Griffin as we think, or if maybe they can fire it off. Well, you know, Andy already up a game here. We're joining in game number two. So I guess it was that big of a beating here. Uh, we already just switched it and it looks like andy is living by the abcs of uh always be grazing here bbd you know i'm a big fan of the grazer i i, I agree with that i i really feel like grazer is just such a powerful card in this deck that when i see a grazer in the open hand i'm like let's go yeah, I was really confused when we were testing for this game and you kept a hand with grazers and no lands, but you're just all about the ABCs here, so I can respect that. Yeah, and you know, you're going to draw the lands you need. You don't always draw the grazers that you need. <laughs> oh, world champion being Brian Brown doing here, giving you some life lessons here. So here's our Barrio Grazer putting in one of these Ravnica bounce lands. One thing I really love about the way the mana base works in this amulet deck is that Andy got to play Beseju as, as the land to, to play this grazer and then pick it back up and now gets to utilize it, mm. you know, as, as well. So really allows for some cool dynamics where you get to play utility lands 
like for their normal intended purpose of producing mana, but you also get to possibly pick them up and utilize them again. Yep, I do love that. So I see a Chalice of the Void on zero. BBD, what? What are we what are we doing with that one? Yeah, Chalice is a kind of a marginal uh, sideboard card that can be used against Amulet, and it shuts down Summoner's Pact. So, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, is it worth dedicating a card out of my sideboard specifically for one card in my opponent's deck? Granted, it is a very powerful card, yeah. uh, but in the context of Hardened Scales, it does make sense because artifacts matter here. You can sac sacrifice that to something like an Arcbound Ravager, so it's not completely, you know, one-dimensional in that regard. Yeah, definitely usually not the type of card I would love is something so narrow. But here, as it stands, Andy Wilson had that amazing start of turn one Grazer, turn two Dryad, but there are no other lands being cast there. There's no Urza Saga. Um, and, you know, maybe Andy made the choice because I, th I think me and you were talking a lot about the amulet deck going into this event and it's an extremely tough deck to sideboard you know we, we're not sure do we take out sagas do we uh do we never take out lands that kind of thing and looking at the sideboard from griffin hall there is a lot of ways to deal with there is a saga and so that might have meant that andy might take some of those out right it is it is possible sometimes you do want to board those out however because griffin's interaction is a lot of more one for one based. I'm not always interested in doing that. I think I the power of the card is so high that I would rather uh, just sometimes take that unfortunate trade, but have access to one of my most powerful cards. Yeah, I think so too. So as it stands, you know, Andy's draw is not great. We see the dismember fired off on the Ink Moth Nexus, but uh, ooh, speed lunking off the top. That is pretty nice. This is Amulet at home, basically. Tell us how the interaction on this card because it is uh, a little a little tough to to grasp. Yeah, so it allows your lands to come into play untapped, which does kind of work with Amulet. I'm not entirely sure exactly how all those interactions with this card work, but it kind of provides you with a nice little mid-rangey way to get some of the same value, but also uh, similar to like a Dryad, it can actually help you accelerate in some of those earlier turns as well. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of the fifth Amulet of Vigor in this deck. So um, a nice little card here, something we saw Dom Harvey uh, do a lot of in the Amulet list, kind of the the amulet godfather, if you will, as he just top aided Pro Tour Barcelona with the deck and uh, has been playing it, you know, nonstop. One thing I really like about how about Andy this game is that he followed my strategy of Arboreal Grazer and then missing land drops. You know, <laughs> wow, just yeah. really went with your school of thought on that one, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> But yeah, realistically, I have to assume Andy probably has something like the one ring and is just missing a fourth land to be able to get there. Yeah, and almost assuredly Titan, you know, all the things ready to go for the late game. And, you know, that being said, Griffin Hall's attacks are, you know, there's no real way to put this lightly. It's embarrassing. You know, these are not <laughs> these are not good at all. But if you can get one Arcbound Ravager with the Hardened Scales and the Ozolith, all of a sudden it could easily be gained. That's how powerful this Hardened Scales deck can be. But when you don't have all the right pieces, uh, it can sometimes look very lackluster. Yeah, I, I think one of the really, like, it looks so anemic right now, but like you're saying, a single Arcbound Ravager can immediately swing this game, could even possibly be lethal with Walking Ballista. So, because the beautiful thing about the Walking Ballista is you can deal the combat damage and then fire off all the, all the counters on it as well. So it kind of double dips in that regard. So I do think that, you know, while this doesn't look like anything, it could get out of control pretty quickly. You know what's also out of control are those awesome shorts, those Mario shorts. I'm 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 even more favoring Andy after witnessing those shorts. I mean, I am here for it. I need a pair of those immediately. I would say those are more, those are fully in control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are great. So there is engineered explosive for one, and probably answer asking some question of how Zabaz works when it goes to the graveyard, stuff like that, as Zabaz is just a very tricky card as well. Uh, does only get the one card. 
And there is Boros Garrison, which has to be one of the best possible draws. Enters the battlefield, untaps, returns Beseju, and now next turn, like you were saying, the One Ring is definitely online, but if there is another Bounce Land, you know, like a Simic Growth Chamber or something like that, Primetime's online as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a, that was a huge pickup. And the Engineer Explosives critically really uh, kind of shut down the, the power potential of Griffin's board. Mm -hmm. So kind of dodged the immediate threat and produced a situation to possibly pull ahead. All right, a flavor fail here. We got two rings here, you know, supposed to be fighting over one of them. But you know what? We'll let this slide. It's like a Sauron versus Goku or something. Is that what's going on? It's like... <laughs> yeah, that's the next secret layer. <laughs> yeah. So here we go. We see Amulet and Spelunking here. Uh, and basically the interaction with this is together, they don't do anything. You pick one, you know, so um, doesn't really interact favorably here at all. And then if you were to get a second Amulet, you're basically ignoring Spelunking. And sometimes Spelunking will actually hurt you um in, in those scenarios so as it stands right now you can kind of just picture that there's one amulet on the battlefield still though one ring to protect for the turn and then also uh access to now potentially more mana this this could be a big turn for andy How, what do you think of that bbd haywire might i thought was auto directed at the one ring but didn't Go for it. Just went for an amulet here. Is Does that surprise you? It does surprise me a little bit, yeah. I, I think that would have... I think that the one ring is is dangerous here. Also, respect here. Here's Gemstone Cavern number two to legend roll the other one while being on the play. Sometimes you just can't take out lands, though. Right. And I, I love the inclusion of cards like Gemstone Caverns in a lot of these decks because... You know, one of the aspects of a deck like Hardened Scales is that it can be a little slow sometimes. Yeah. And yeah, you, you want to have access. Sometimes that, that lets you like almost steal the play and that can be the difference maker in some difficult matchups. Yeah, and I mean, we can remember back to uh, Pro Tour Barcelona, not the most recent one, but uh, you know, the one way back when, which was actually won by Hardened Scales, you and the champion of that event, uh, both had a common card in, in their deck or in your deck list that really was accelerating you. And that was Mox Opal. You know, that was a card that was incredible in these hardened scales decks. And it wasn't really the fault of the hardened scales deck that that card got banned. I feel like it was, uh, you know, more your fault because you were playing Urza for that one, right? I was. Yeah. I don't think that, uh, I, I don't think that me stumbling through tournaments is why ultimately mox opal got banned but i think a lot of the decks that i liked to play uh did contribute to uh why that ended up getting taken out of the format yeah we're still gonna blame you though absolutely after we were all dancing around the table testing hogak bbd is like you know what this urza card looks pretty cool and then you of course destroy all of us in the tournament and what place top 16 at that event yeah uh, somewhere around there yeah it was one of, that was one of my best tournaments Love it. Okay, so here we go. The one ring drew a couple of cards. And now Andy is doing some math, and that's never a welcome sight if you're across the table from me. You're like, oh no. Yeah, this is this is a situation where it's like, okay, how much mana do I get if I do this, this, and this? What does that allow me to do? Uh trying to weigh kind of best options for how to deal with this. Again. Griffin has kind of rebuilt a board a little bit. Yeah. So this this is you, you, you don't necessarily have the luxury of getting this turn wrong uh for Andy. So it is good to kind of make sure that you have all your you know eggs in a row or whatever the saying is before you <laughs> yeah. start before you start doing things. Put them in a row, put them in a basket, whatever. Just just put those eggs somewhere. Um, you know, that being said, the Urza Saga here is about to go off to Chapter 3 for Griffin. So you can get some spicy one-offs here. You can get a Pithing Needle, Haywire Mite, something like that. But outside of that, Griffin's still missing some tools to go way over the top. So I don't even know if Andy for sure has to win the game this turn, but uh, might as well try. So here we go. Primeval Titan with Spelunking in play. So 
when they're going to enter the battlefield tapped. Instead, they won't. So Vesuva coming into play, copying Boros Garrison, their Slayer Stronghold, um, to give haste to Amulet Titan. Or Primeval Titan, excuse me. I mean, you might as well just rename it Amulet Titan at this point. <laughs> might as well. Might as well. Frost Titan, Amulet Titan, Grave <laughs> Ooh, Titan. Frost Titan. There we go. That's a spicy one I forgot about. So here we go. Well, Searching for the first ones. We have Valakut. We have Simic Growth Chamber. And now instead of Amulet, where they enter the battlefield tapped and you untap them, it's essentially the same when you shortcut it. And, uh, get so this looks like... Labs. If Andy has a Dryad here, that's that's a huge play. Not only is this Primeval hitting hitting for eight damage, but Dryad will allow an additional land drop. And Andy picked up the Vesuva, so that additional land drop could be Vesuva as a second Valakud, and oh, so really take over the game. Yeah, nice six damage there. Here's the real question, though: If you have a Summoner's Pact, are you going to cast it? uh no to go get that's, it. A, that's a that's a trick <laughs> question because of the uh, chalice of the void well i mean it, it's still your opponent's responsibility to counter it if you got that's fair that is fair packed, you might have to give it a shot i think if i think in that scenario we probably would have seen andy pick up that besaju yeah probably so there Here is the go. dryad dryad coming down and let's see it's not the vesuva maybe that it means is. there's more there's some grazing going on Possibly now, four counters on those ballistas could have been pointed at the dryad for lethal. Uh, yeah, that was that was an option. Decided, yeah. Oh, but look at this! Andy decides to pick up the Besaju now to get rid of Urza Saga. This was a really nice clean turn from Andy here. Absolutely, yeah. This is kind of. The, what you could hope for from that turn, it's it's pretty unlikely that you're actually winning the game on that yeah. turn starting from kind of a lower resource setup, but you can clear the board or clear most of the board and set up a situation where now there's a lot of different problems for Griffin, probably going to be unable to answer all of them. Yeah, this is one of those scenarios where like, yeah, you, you don't have the ability to win, but now you just think as the amulet titan player what is the way i can maximize my chances of stopping my opponent from doing anything possible you know i mean you you can always get those kind of lands that shut down your opponent in some way bajuka bonds or get a besage you plus bounce land so you have a besage you back you know all these like really in-depth line that you only really get and understand from playing amulet titan for hours on end uh, but that's kind of the the fun of the deck in my opinion. And it is really contextual too, because some in some cases it's like doing what Andy did there and and setting up this nice Valakut board, killing one of the ballistas. But in other cases against other decks, it's about finding resiliency for your own hand to maybe get some Teleria Wests or something, so that you're not. Uh, out of resources if your opponent like has interaction or whatever it's just it very contextual to whatever the matchup is totally agree and we see griffin's whole turn is double you know destruction of enchantments and artifacts takes out dryad and spelunking but you got to think this is just not the kind of game that you want to be playing up against a already on the battlefield primeval titan plus an active ring yeah i don't i don't think this is where you want to be I think there's a, a very strong chance, unless unless Andy has a really bad hand, that the game is just going to end uh, right here. Yep, and of course that Chalice of the Void that came down on what turn two is probably doing some work. You know, you can look at that card and be like, "Wow, that card dish did stone nothing." But we haven't seen Andy's hand. I'm sure there's a Summoner's Pact or two. Um, so having to naturally draw Dryad here or second Prime Time. Yeah, there's a good look at the hand. There's second Prime Time. So if anything, you can play that and give it haste. And no matter what, you have 14 power worth of trample damage coming in. And that's pretty convenient for uh, this, this board state. It is really nice against an opponent at two less than 14 life with two toughness of creatures in play. Well, wait, carry the three divided by six. <laughs> yeah, I, that checks out to me, BBD. 
Now, is there anything that Griffin can have right now to be able to not die to that trample strategy right on the spot? You know, I'm not I'm not sure. There's there's probably not a whole lot with just an ink wealth nexus up. Uh, oh, I got it, BBD. Dismember shrinks it to only taking 11 damage. There it is. You know, Corey, I lost the finals of a PTQ once because of that. Really? Because it, it shrunk the clock by one? I was, I was, it was game three and I attacked for lethal with a Gideon Jura and my opponent dismembered it, didn't kill it, but did put them down to one and they top decked a lethal lightning bolt and killed me. Oh no. Were you yeah, feeling was, great about that one? Uh, no, no, not, not, not great. <laughs> Gideon Jura. Wow. That ages you uh, real quick for all the 10 <laughs> people that know that card, huh? <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> but I think in this case, there won't be the dismember. I'm, I'm, I'm calling my shot. I think it's going to be uh, actually lethal. Yeah. And I mean, that's a card like you don't even really want against. And then again, if you slip past that and you can survive at one, the one ring is going to finish it off here. So I think we're just going through the motions here. Andy is going to be able to pick up this match two and oh, and you know, really played out like we thought wouldn't you think bbd this one looked pretty rough yeah like there was there was some moments early in the game where it stalled out a bit but andy was able to like andy had the tools in hand once once he could find more lands uh to really snowball the game and it, it just took being able to do that and andy had enough reactive elements like that engineer explosives to slow griffin down enough to buy that time Totally agree. And there is the handshake. Andy Wilson advancing to nine and two. And we were kind of talking in between rounds here about what is needed to make the top eight. And looking back to the RC in Atlanta, X21 was not safe at that point. You know, of course, the numbers are a little bit different here, a little bit larger, uh, maybe different rounds and stuff like that. But X2 not being safe. And then as far as the Pro Tour invite, X2 and two was kind of that line where those players went to the pro tour. So picking up your third loss here, BBD kind of hurts. It definitely hurts. It doesn't, it, it's probably an elimination from the top eight itself and, and some of those, you know, bigger prizes, both cash and the world's invite, but you're still live for a lot of other stuff. And that's one of the things about these kinds of tournaments is it's not just top eight or bust. That sometimes is the mentality but you can get a lot of value just by doing consistently well at tournaments, even if you're not getting exactly into the top eight. Yeah, because I mean, you experienced this with your career, right? Like you were always that player that was really on the edge a lot, right? Like you were getting very close to GP top eights, you know, dominating local events, you know, that kind of player. And then all of a sudden you just broke through and then everything started to click for you, right? Yeah, and I think one of the things that is... I don't want to say like an issue, but as a lot of times the problem is people will have a good result in a tournament and they'll feel bad about it. And I just, yeah. I don't think that's a healthy mindset for the longevity of, of doing well in magic tournaments. Yeah. You have to cherish those good results, even if it's not the great result you were necessarily looking for. Yeah. I definitely go the opposite spectrum of that. Whenever I have a good result, like I top eight some event or something like that. My fiance absolutely hates this, but I take the whole next week to celebrate, you know, it is my victory <laughs> tour. I like make sure and just, you know, soak it in because you're right. If you look at magic as a game where you're only happy when you win, you're going to be sad a lot. It's a very tough game that has a lot of variants. So you got to be happy uh, with any big victory you have. I mean, you are still celebrating to this day from your world win, right? Every day. Yeah, I knew Every it. Every single day, yeah. I knew it. So we are going to take ourselves a short break. On the other side of this break, though, we do have a video with our very own Niall here showcasing a little bit of this uh, heavy play, this really cool product. So don't go anywhere and check out this video. If you've been a DreamHack Denver, then you've seen tons of players enjoying all the heavy play products from the play mats to the deck boxes to the curved sleeves. I pulled a few of those players aside to talk to them about their experience with the products in a tournament setting, and here's what they had to say. All right, so Dingo, you are using the magnetic play mat and also the premium deck box. Tell me about it. So I've always been a one that really likes playing with felt-esque mats, mm -hmm. and I was absolutely 
absolutely blown away by how smooth the surface of the magnetic play mat was. I thought it was just wonderful to like feel it, the cards slide across so smoothly. Absolutely love the magnetic play mat. And the deck box being magnetized also, got to put it in the left corner. It was absolutely amazing, very space efficient for a foldable play mat that fits in my bag very easily. Can't rant enough about how much I love this product. You particularly liked the magnetic features. Correct. Being able to just carry the play mat around, oh, yeah. deck and all. I always hated struggling to like roll up play mats in the past and try to fit them in my bag where it doesn't fit geometrically compared to everything else. So being able just to fold it up, put it right behind my binder, fits in nice and smoothly. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you've been loving them. Thank you very much, Dingo. Of course. All right, Caroline, you've been using almost the entire suite of heavy play products. You've got the play mat, you've got the deck box, you've been using the sleeves. Tell me about your experience so far. So, first of all, I was so hyped. I really loved the magnetic, like, just whole thing, just adding. And I didn't realize this, which makes sense. When I went to put my deck box on my de on my play mat, mm -hmm. it just snapped into place. Yeah. I was like, well, that's great because you don't know how many times I've knocked that over. <laughs> but the real winner for me was the play mat because I got stuck on one of those table intersections mm. this round and I just had no problems. I actually didn't even know I was in one of the intersections. Wow, so, that's incredible. Yeah. So just between two tables where normally no a play issues. mat You could probably give me like a whole like foot <laughs> gap and I'd probably be fine. <laughs> now let's talk about the sleeves because I know you've also been using those, the curved sleeves. What have your thoughts been with them? I didn't use a double one. I just used regular. Sure. Sorry, I'm not gonna double sleep my craft deck. <laughs> um, and I had a blast. They were shuffled so nicely. I didn't have any issues. I will say, bonus, my opponent asked me all about them multiple times. <laughs> so they wanted to know where I could get them. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Caroline, for using the products and letting us know what you think about them. Hope you continue to enjoy it. Thank you. All right, Jerry, I know you have used many heavy play products. What has been your impression of them? What have you been using so far? My initial impression was just about the aesthetic, the overall look. Uh, very sleek, very stylized, and definitely look like they could be built to last. And then you actually like lay out the products, lay out the play mat, play around with like the dice tray a little bit, feel like how just rewarding and satisfying the magnets are when they come together and everything. And uh, just after using them for a few different events, a few different tournaments, and this feeling like, yeah, these, these are really going to hold up. These are going to last me a long time. Yeah, I've heard a lot of really good things about the magnet system. How have you liked being able to just carry your play mat around events with your decks and dice and everything just attached? It's not so much for me carrying them around. Like, I, I feel like I need a bag that can hold all the stuff rather than just, like, having the play mat sure. under my arm or whatever. But at the table is where I have really liked it, where I, I want to keep my things, like, nice, neat, and organized. And this is a way to just, like, have things be locked in place, all connected together and again just like it feels really satisfying yeah well they're great products thank you for talking to us about them we're gonna get back to coverage thanks jerry